So let's see, let's see our Bibles today. Let's see our Bibles today. Let's say word. word. One more time, say word. word. Let's see your pens. Word. The lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to let's turn to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. The number sixth book in the New Testament. Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Hmm. Let me pray for you as you turn there. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for being good to us, and we pray that you would teach us. You are the teacher, that you would reveal truth to us and make it very plain and easy to understand. Thank you for your word, and thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. I was eating dinner last night, uh, spaghetti, uh, sauce, cheese, steaming hot. I was sitting on the couch, and my couch said, Psst, hey, Miles. I looked around, sit down here. I looked at the couch, and the couch said, why don't you put that spaghetti on the cushion? <laughs> I want to feel that warm stuff on me. Just, kind of freaky couch. He says, no, it's just, I want it on me. You just eat it right off the couch. It's like, that's not right. He said, this is my cushion. I can do with it what I want. I was like, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Then as we were talking, the TV, Psst, hey, Miles, put the cup right up on top of the TV. Just let it drip down. It's okay. I said, but what about your circuits? If you get water in there, hey, these are my circuits. I can do anything I want with them. Just put the cup right there. It's like, I don't know about that. Then the clock, psst, hey, Miles, open me up, and I want to take a shower. Just spray some water on me. I haven't had a shower since they made me, so I'll take a, take a shower. Just put water on me. I said, no, if you put water, it's going to break. They said, these are my gears. I can do with them what I want. As we continue our series called Who is God, everyone say, Who is God? Who is God? We've been looking at this living room behind me to get evidence that there is a God and what kind of God is he. And I want to do a little review before we get into today's message. Now, if you look at this living room behind me, we've learned several things about God in this living room. One, we learned that they are, the, the living room is a limited object. Everyone say limited object. And that means that the living room couldn't cause itself. Something had to cause the living room because it's limited. And then we saw that the, the living room also has a design, and because it's a limited object, the limited object of the living room had to receive a design from someone else. And then we saw that, that it had a design where it was going to get its purpose, and we saw because it's a limited object and it was caused by someone else and designed by someone else, we also learned that it gets its purpose from the person who designed it, because its purpose is to fulfill the intent of its design. And so today we're going to talk about the next step in that, but before we do that, let's look at Romans chapter 1, because Romans chapter 1 lays a very foundational truth about the living room and getting evidence about God from the living room. Let's look what it says in verse 20, Romans 1.20. It says, For since the creation of the world, everyone say creation of the world. Yeah. Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, people, are without excuse. Let me read it again. Since the creation of the world, everyone say creation of the world. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we, they, us, are without excuse. So what this is basically saying is that if we look at the things that God has made, God's invisible attributes his wisdom, his creativity, his love, his coordinating power, uh, his ability to organize things, all his invisible attributes, his intelligence, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. So that's when we look at things that are made, when we think of, look at the world, we, it's obvious that God is there and it's obvious what kind of God he is. So we go back to the living room. It's obvious that somebody had to put this living room here. It's obvious that it didn't design itself, organize itself. It's obvious that it didn't give itself its purpose because its purpose is to fulfill the intent of its design, and it didn't give itself its design. 
And so we started asking ourselves, well, who did it? Well, we considered nothing. Maybe it did it by itself. And so we have the nothing jar here, which represents nothing. And maybe nothing put it there. Maybe nothing designed it. And maybe nothing gave its purpose. And we all kind of came in agreement that that's impossible because it's scientifically impossible and logically impossible for nothing to do anything. Nothing does nothing. Can I get amen? amen? Now, if you believe that nothing does something, then you need to prove that. So make something happen out of nothing. You can't. So something had to do it, and we all agreed that man was the one to uh, cause this living room, somebody, some person, and man, some person or group of persons designed it, and some group of persons gave it its purpose. So we kind of all agreed that somebody did that. Okay? So now we're going to take it to the next step. If man caused it and man designed it and man gave it its purpose, and its purpose, by the way, is to fulfill the design, and only man knows the potential of the design of the living room because man's the one who designed it. If man did all that, who develops the rules? Everyone say rules. Who develops the rules or the laws by which the living room is supposed to follow in order to fulfill its purpose? In other words, is there a right way and a wrong way to use the living room? And so who does that? Well, obviously, man. Man does, because man said, I'm going to put the TV here, and I'm going to put daddy's chair right here, and the rule is that he sits in that chair. Okay, matter of fact, I have, a, I have a chair that I sit in, a seat that I sit in when I eat dinner, the same seat, and one of my kids always want to sit in my seat. And, you know, they want to, you know, I, for whatever reason, you know, they, they just want me to kick them out. So I come in and go, now this is not an absolute rule, this is just my rule, it's no big deal, you know, but I, I go, why are you in my seat? It happens every day. It's like that rule just not getting in there, right? <laughs> but, but so if I put the chair there, I'm the one who has the right to put, make the rule. It doesn't mean it has to be absolute, but, you know, that's where the rule came from. So if man caused the living room, designed the living room, uh, uh, gave the living room its purpose, then man says, well, here are the rules you are supposed to follow if you want to fulfill the, the, the uh, uh, purpose of the living room. Now, so if you look in your notes, Guiding principle number one, at the very top of your note, says that limited objects fulfill their purpose by following absolute rules provided to them from the designer. This is just a basic principle. If, you, if a limited object can only fulfill its purpose if it follows the rules given to it by its designer. This living room will function properly not when it decides on its own how it functions. The TV can't decide on its own. The clock can't decide it's an own. It has to follow the rules of the designer. Can I get amen? amen. The, it, it, because the designer is the one who put it there. The designer one had the purpose, and the designer says, here's how you're going to do it. Okay? So here's a million-dollar question. Who decides the rules of all the limited objects that man didn't design? God. Think about it. Man didn't put the stars in the sky. God created them. God designed them. God gave them their purpose. Matter of fact, the Bible says he put the sun to be a greater light in the day and the stars in the moon to be a lesser light at night and to guide us and tell us what times, a, a time of the year it is. Animals, the ocean, trees, oxygen, CO2. What is, the, what is God's the one who created all that and God's the one who gives us his purpose and God's the one who decides how they're used. You and I are limited objects, and we did not design ourselves. So that means you and I cannot determine the rules by which we live. Woo! Listen very closely. <laughs> because this goes completely against what you hear on TV every single day. It goes completely against what you hear at your job, what you hear in your head, what you something, well, I know a lot of you believe. I can make my own rules. No, you can't. You didn't cause yourself, you didn't design yourself, you don't give yourself purpose. We saw that last week, and therefore you don't determine the rules because the rules have to be designed to fulfill the purpose, and the purpose is designed to fulfill the design. And the design was caused by the, 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 the person who caused it. You didn't do any of that for yourself. You just showed up. Matter of fact, uh, my secretary had a baby. He's watching right now, little Max. Max is sitting there. Max is one day old. Can't do a thing except breathe, eat, and go to the bathroom. But he is so beautiful, so wonderful. I'm sorry, he's perfect in, in, in all ways. But he's just sitting there, but he had nothing to do with it. He, he didn't sit there and go, Mom, you know, wait till I show you my tongue. Wait till I show you my eyes. Wait till I explain to you how my brain works. He, he don't know any of that. And so you and I, we did not bring ourselves into this world. We did not create ourselves. God did it all. God did it all. So 
do you and I have the right to say, here are the rules? And the answer to that question is absolutely no. Now, you may say, well, I disagree. You have a right to disagree. Let's read. Let's re look in your notes. Look in your notes. Number one, <laughs> universal moral laws exist. Universal, absolute moral laws exist. You will hear all the time that there are no absolute truths that apply to everybody at every time, and our culture teaches a completely different uh, mindset, which is uh, tolerance. I'm supposed to be tolerant. Now, let me explain two sides of tolerance. To one side of tolerance is, if you disagree with me, I need to be respectful of you as a person. Absolutely. I need to be kind to you as a person. Absolutely. I need to uh, be nice to you or whatever. Absolutely. I shouldn't put you down just because you believe something different. I, that's fine. That's very biblical. Love your enemies or love people who disagree with you. They don't have to be enemies necessarily. Love everybody. No doubt. The other side of tolerance is this is that all truth claims or belief systems are equal. So therefore, I need to respect you because what you believe is just as true as mine. That's what I would say the evidence will show is not true. <laughs> evidence will show not true. Let's do a little test. Is, how many of you would say this is a clock? And by the way, it's not a trick. This is, this is a clock. It's not a real clock, but, you know, it's, these things don't move, but it's a clock. This represents a clock. How many of you say it's a clock? Do you agree it's a clock? Yes. It's a clock. I'm not, it's, not, it's not a trick. But what if the clock said, I'm not a clock. I'm a drum set. Is the clock wrong? Yeah, you, you guys know. You, it's not a trick question. This is real basic. It's, real, it's like it's got to be a trick. This is a clock. It was designed, let, let me say, it was designed to be a clock by its designer. That designer said, I'm making a clock. And all of a sudden the clock says, I'm a drum set. Is the clock wrong? Yes. Is the clock wrong? Yes. Okay, if I say to you, this is a drum set, am I wrong? Yes. Hmm, very interesting. Uh, this couch back here, the person who designed the couch says, I'm going to make a couch so people can sit on it, uh, lay around on it, watch TV, sleep, whatever it is. But that's a couch. And if the couch, is, is that a couch? Yes. That's what the designer said. The designer made a couch. The designer made a couch. And all of a sudden I say, well, it's not a couch. It's a trampoline. Am I wrong? <laughs> this is not a trick question. The designer made a couch, and he made it for you to sit on, lay on, lounge on, watch TV, whatever. And all of a sudden, I say, it's a, it's a trampoline. Am I wrong? Okay. This is a TV. It has circuits, electrical, pictures, HD, boom, 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 boom. It's a television. It does everything televisions do. If I come and say, uh, by the way, is it a television? Not a trick question, it's a television. And I come and say, no, it's not a, it's not a television. I'm going to play handball against it. Am I wrong? <laughs> now, if you disagree with me, who are you to say? All y'all are intolerant because you're not valuing my opinion. You guys are saying, but I'm wrong. But you guys are intolerant. How could you say you're tolerant and then you disagree with me? <laughs> you're not answering the question. I don't, no one's saying anything here. I'm going to say, if you're truly tolerant, you have to agree with me. Now, by the way, by the way, you have to validate my opinion. By the way, I don't believe in tolerance. In other words, when you have tolerance imposed on you by culture, it doesn't mean you have to accept it. You don't have to go around and say, oh, I need to be tolerant because everybody else says. No, you don't. You can, you can disagree. It's called disagreeing. Let me, let me go ahead. Let me show you why true tolerance is literally impossible. And all the people you know who are tolerant, they prove they're intolerant by how they tolerate. Watch. No, I mean, you'll get it. It's not, I know it's kind of late, but it's, it's really simple. Uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa spent her whole life, you know, her ministry life, I should say, ministering to the poor of the poor, the poorest of the poor. And, 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 and I believe, forgive me if this is wrong, but I, uh, what I heard was her mission was, her purpose was to give people dignity in death. And she held people when they died. Hitler killed over 6 million Jews. And how horrible all that process was. If you are tolerant, you must agree that both of them are equally right. Because who are you to say Hitler's wrong? Where do you get your belief system? Some people believe Hitler's right, he's their hero. And by the way, if you're tolerant, you need to tolerate them and say their truth claim is as equal as my truth claim. Because if, 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 if we have to tolerate and all truths are equal, then both of them are equally as good and equally as bad. 
Now you know in your heart that's wrong. Something's wrong with that. Well, how can I be tolerant and, and disagree? Well, you don't have to be tolerant. Let it go. You have to be, you, you, here's the thing about tolerant people who claim they're tolerant. Every time tolerant people disagree with you, they cease to be tolerant. <laughs> Think about it. I believe Jesus is the only way. Well, you're wrong. You're not. You're a bigot. And by the way, we, we I, we've been told, called this. You're a bigot, and, and you need to be tolerant. Wait a minute, Charlie. You need to tolerate me. Why are you not tolerating me right now? Because you're wrong. Wait, 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 wait. Your whole belief system is about equal. This is your belief system, by the way. My belief, so you have, to, you have to accept my belief system or the Bible's belief system just as equal as your belief system. You don't have to, you, that's tolerant. So as soon as someone says they're tolerant and then they intolerate you, they just violated their own law. There's a, there's a law called uh, law of non-contradiction. Everybody say non-contradiction. <laughs> this is so smooth. This is so, this will put it in very plain terms. N the law of non-contradiction, by the way, if you're writing down, you want to write this down, because if you're taking notes. Non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction says this, that the, w something can't be something and at the same time not be something. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say it a few times. you get it. It's real simple. Something can't be something or claim to be something and at the same time not be that thing. So you can't say this is a clock and at the same time say it's not a clock. Are you following me? That's like duh. It is a duh thing. But we do it all the time. You, someone, this is a clock. No, it's not a clock. Both those view, views cannot be true. It can't be a clock and not be a clock. Okay? It, it can't. The couch can't be a couch and not be a couch. Are you following me? A TV can't be a TV and not be a TV at the same time. It can't. That's just that's a law of non-contradiction. You can't do that. Because then what is it? Well, it's neither. Well, it's there. It's a TV. That's what it is. And so when someone who says they're tolerant says, I disagree with you and you are wrong, and, they, and then they fight you and call you names, they are acting intolerant. But yet they're claiming to be tolerant. So how can they be tolerant and be intolerant at the same time? You can't. That makes them intolerant. That makes them contradiction. That means they don't, they're not what they say. Now, for you as a Christian, how do you deal with that? You don't claim to be tolerant. What I mean by that is you're loving, yes. You're respectful, absolutely. But you believe, and, 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 and your position would be, that there are absolute right and wrongs, and all true claims are not the same. Some are wrong. In other words, Hitler killed people. Millions of them. Horrible. That is wrong. It's wrong, period. There's nothing right about it. That is a TV. It is not a coaster. That's a couch. It's not a plate. And it never will be a plate. It never should be a plate. That was not the intent. And by the way, the only person to decide that is the person who designed it. The, so the, there are universal moral laws. Now, still you're saying, well, well who decides? Huh. You're a limited object. You don't decide the laws for you because you didn't create yourself. God does. God does. And he gives evidence to his laws. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing about God is that someone can say, as a Christian, you can say, well, the Bible says, and a non-Christian say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, you don't need to believe in the Bible. There's more evidence than that. There's your conscience. Turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. You're right there. You should be right there. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Many people will say, well, what happens to these people who never believe in God or they never heard about Jesus? Are they going to go to heaven or hell? How is God going to judge them? Which, by the way, uh, it's a good question to ask, but don't let that question and the answer and the dilemma block you from having a relationship with God. Look what it says in verse 11. It says, God, there is no partiality with God. And we're, we're going to see that God is going to judge them by his conscience that he put in them. For as many have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. People, people who just sin be, outside the law, they're going to perish without, they're going to be judged on what they know. Let's keep reading. 
And as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law, for not hearers of the law are just in, in God's sight, but the doers of the law will be justified. Verse 14, when Gentiles or non-Jews who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these also not having the law are a law to themselves. God is going to judge them according to the law he put in their heart. Let's keep reading. And then it says, Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves for their thoughts, accusing them or excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to the gospel. In other words, people who never heard the gospel, God says, I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a little safety net. I'm going to put my conscience in them. They know. They know. By the way, that you will never prob probably in your lifetime never meet anybody that falls in that category because the gospel is everywhere. And by the way, when you meet them, if they haven't heard it, you tell them. So that, that, doesn't apply, that doesn't apply to anybody you will ever meet. God says, no, no, I put my conscience in them, and when, I'll judge them based on how well they listen to that, their conscience. And, and Romans 1, verse 18 and 19 says a very similar thing, that God put their conscience in them, his conscience in them. When, I, when, it, when you hear of child molestation, oh, conscience, that's just not right. When you hear rape, that's just not right. When you hear things that are wrong, you say, yes, it's not right. Where does that come from? It didn't come from you because you couldn't create right and wrong. You didn't create right and wrong. God did. God did. God gave that to you. So there's internal evidence. And by the way, if you ever watch television, especially for all of you who are in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, you compare what's on TV now to what was on TV 30 years ago. What people say, what images you say, you would never have seen that years ago. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I mean, naked people, curse words, et cetera, sexually explicit stuff. It's like crazy. And if you go to the mall, you see these, these billboards, people, it's like pornography. It's pornography. It, it, by the way, it, it would have been pornography when we were kids. And why, why is that? It's because over time, our conscience gets seared and we start to accept things we normally wouldn't accept and it breaks God's heart. Let me say it a different way. There are people who believe in evil things. They're in prison, some of them. They believe in evil things, and they believe those things to be right for them. And yet we put them in jail because we disagree. But yet if we're really tolerant, we need to accept them. If we're truly tolerant, tolerant don't work. There's a right and a wrong. And so people have all these different beliefs. So some believe, people believe you can have 50 wives. Some believe you're supposed to have one wife. Some people believe you're supposed to have sex only with your wife, and some people have sex with whatever you want. All, all these different beliefs. So who's right? Well, God says, I'm going to put my law on your conscience. And by the way, if that doesn't work, I got, an, I got another one, another way. Turn to Romans chapter 6. It's like when you sit in a dark room and the first, the minute you turn the lights off, you can't see anything. And then over time, your eyes adjust to the darkness and you can see. So the first time you see something sinful or something that's inconsistent with your design, it's like, ooh, it shocks you. Oh, I can't look at that. I can't hear that. I can't do that. And then over time, you adjust and you find yourself saying things you wouldn't have normally said or doing things you wouldn't normally do. For all you have who have been in drugs and alcohol, the first time you drank something or smoked something or snorted something, it was, ah, it was foreign to you, and then you got used to it, and all of a sudden it was okay to you. But that doesn't mean it's okay. It just means you adjusted to something very dark. So, so, so the, the question is, well, how do you know if it's dark? Well, one, your conscience will bear witness. God's word will bear witness. And then there's the, 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 the other uh, safety guard that God has that you don't want to experience is that death will happen. Look what it says in Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. The very first page, second page of the Bible. The wages of sin is death. In other words, in other words, when you do, when you break the rules that God has set, something dies. You can be tolerant all you want, but when you break God's law, God's laws, something dies. Well, this is my body, and I'm gonna do with it what I want. Okay, go ahead, but that doesn't mean you're right. 
Go to any prison in this world, and I'll show you a bunch of people who said, I can do what I want. And someone very intolerant said, no, you can't. Called the popo. <laughs> you can't. I can right now, I can right now go out and cheat on my wife. There will be grave consequences. Can I get amen? I, I, I shudder to think of the consequences. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, none of them are good. None of them are good. The devil will deceive me that this, these, these few moments together will be worth the consequences. He will deceive me that I'll get away with it. This is a whole other story. But none of them are good. I, I, and I go, if I go to my wife and say, hey, honey, this is just what I believe, huh, that ain't going to fly. <laughs> Intolerance will become personified. <laughs> bam, bam. Right. Before, before God kills me, my wife will kill me. And if my wife don't kill me, y'all will kill me. And, and by the way, you should. Not kill me, kill me, but I will never stand here again. And I won't try to convince you. No, no, no. So look what it says. G Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God put man in the garden of Eden and tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day you will die. In other words, God said from the very beginning, in the garden, by the way, this is in the garden of Eden, no sin, everything's perfect. He said, Adam and Eve, even here there are rules. You guys have never sinned, this is perfect. Matter of fact, everything I made is good. God said in Genesis, in, in Genesis 2, uh, 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 everything he said is good. But guess what? There's rules. There's a right and a wrong. And the consequence of wrong is death. The wage of sin is death. What does that mean? Is that God caused you, he created you, God designed you, God gave you purpose, and the purpose is to fulfill the, the potential of your design, a design that's way over your head and your pay grade, and so God says, I'm going to design you marvelously, I'm going to give you a marvelous purpose, and the only way you can fulfill your marvelous purpose is to fulfill my rules. And then we say, no God, I have my own. God says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give you a thing called guilt. I'm going to give you a thing called conscience because you didn't create that. I did. God did. And my conscience is going to guide and direct your behavior. And when you go off, when you violate my rules, by the, rule, by the way, the rules that are consistent with God's character, the rules that are the same rules that are consistent with God's word, the same rules that are consistent with God's purpose, and the same rules that are consistent with God, your design. It's all lined up. And when you violate that, your conscience is going to say, no, 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 don't do that. That's why when you get ready to tell a lie, you feel hot. <laughs> or your heart starts beating. <laughs> oh, 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 some of you are really, if you're really paying attention, some of y'all are thinking, well, how do you know what it means to be hot before you tell a lie? Because <laughs> the heat tells me don't tell the lie. Don't, don't, don't bend the truth. Tell the truth. Or when you look at something you're not supposed to look at, you know you feel guilty. When you say something, you do something you're not supposed to look at, whatever it is, you, your conscience says stop. Uh, don't do that. And you're like, oh, but I want to, but I want to. And you had this battle. Can I get amen? Tell me, you know what I'm saying? Where'd that come from? You didn't create it, God did it. It's, all, it's worldwide, it's global. All of us have it. And so God's going to put your conscience, by the way, if, 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 to, to, to clarify why your conscience is doing that, I'm going to write a book and it's going to explain to you right and wrong. It's going to show you consequences, it's going to show you right, it's going to show you my standard. And by the way, so I created you, I designed you, I gave you a purpose, and I gave you rules that are going to help you maximize your purpose and to, to fulfill your design. And if you follow my rules, life. If you break my rules, death. For example, there are some of you in here who are artists. Amazing. But you're producing no art. Your whole art career is dead. Why? You violated the rules. Rule number one is to obey God. Some of you are mathematicians, some of you are teachers, some of you are, 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 are great parents or whatever it is, and it's not happening. And you see it happening in other people's lives, you wonder why it's not happening in your life? You probably violated the rule. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not physical death only, but death of your opportunities, death of your dreams, death of your relationships, death of your reputation, death of your health, death of your vision, death of your sleep. All that stuff dies as a result of breaking the rules. There are people right now in hospitals addicted because they violated the rules. Dying from disease because they violated the rules. 
So God is saying, I created you, follow my rules, and you will have life and life abundantly, eternal life and abundant life. So here you are sitting here today, and God's saying, listen, I love you, and all of you violated my rules because you're sinners. You don't know any better. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross. He rose from the dead, and he died so you could be forgiven of the penalty of your sin. And you could be set free so you can obey me. By the way, but listen, listen, listen. You, you could be set free where, where you were enslaved to breaking the rules. I don't want to do it, but I keep doing it. I don't want to do it, but I keep doing it. Say amen if that was you. And you're like, why, why do I keep doing the same old thing? How could I be so stupid? Have any of you ever said that? Let me tell you why you could be so stupid, because we are that stupid. We are. We're just thick. But God says, I can set you free. And by the way, I can set you free so you can obey me. Now, before I pray, let me just say this one thing. All of us have and have, have or had a lifestyle. And our lifestyle was how we chose to live. And the world will tell you you can live however you want to live and treat your body however you want to treat your body. And I'm telling you that is a lie. And I'm telling you if you don't believe me, just look at the proof of all the death in your life. Death. You may have a lot of stuff, but you're dead. God says, I want to fill you with life. It's foolproof. How many of your friends are in hospitals? How many of your friends are dead in jail, ruined lives because they follow the rules they're telling you to follow? And they're telling you, you're going to be okay. Get yours. God is saying, I don't play that. And the only reason you're here today, healthy, and have an opportunity to have Christ in your life is because God's grace. Because he says, I'm just going to give you that opportunity. So we're going to pray in a minute. And, and I want you to just listen to what I'm telling you. The rules are this. Sin is violating God's rules. God wants to forgive you of your sins, but he also wants to cleanse you and renew your tendency and desire to violate his rules. And he wants to give you a desire to obey his rules. And once he gives you a desire to obey his rules and you start obeying his rules, you get blessed. And what does blessed mean? Is that God's intended design for you is realized. Woo. Matter of fact, the TV goes from having snow to having a picture. The couch goes from having nasty cushions to having soft cushions. The clock goes from being frozen like it is right now to actually working. That's what happens. God brings what's dead to life, not only in your life, but in the relationships of the people you have. Some of your relationships are dead. Why? Because you broke the rules. God can restore. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, you are so good. You have done so much for us and offered to do so much for us. We have been so hard-headed, so selfish, so self-centered, doing our own thing, thinking we can call the shots, when in fact we don't know anything. And we're killing ourselves, we're killing our relationships, we're killing our bodies, and we keep doing it, thinking we're right. But you said the penalty of sin is death. But that while we were sinners, Jesus died for our sin and rose from the dead. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we'd be saved. If you're watching online, you're in North County, God is the one who created you. He has a plan for your life, but it has to be done his way. And he will not negotiate. He will not negotiate. It is his way or no way. So if you're willing to say, Lord, I want to do it your way, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I believe you love me, and I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I surrender my life to Jesus. I want to obey you, God. I want to live for you. Thank you, God. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer right now, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and acknowledge that you are going to obey God. That you have given your life to Christ and that you want to start obeying him. Stand to your feet. God bless you. Stand to your feet. 
and acknowledge his forgiveness. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Stay standing. God bless you. Very good. We see you. We see you in the balcony. God bless you. Very good. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Now in a minute, we're going to ask all you who are standing, in a minute, we're going to ask you to come down to the altar. If you're watching online, please check the box on your screen. There's a pastor who wants to talk to you online right now. If you're watching in North County, someone's going to be there to receive you. So right now, if you're standing up, in a minute, we're going to ask you to come down to the altar. If you're in the balcony, all you have to do is turn around and walk up, and the ushers will bring you down. And I'm going to ask everybody else not to leave until we get them down here so we don't lose them in the traffic. So right now, if you're standing, just come back to your seat and come on down to the altar, and let's give them a hand as they come on down. Come on, let's give them a hand. they got a long way to walk. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. While we, while we wait for the other people to come, I know you're saying, well, what about the other three points? We're going to get to them next week. I knew I wasn't going to get there. I kept, this thing kept going to the right, it's like five pages just from point one. Uh, let, me, let me say this. Let, let me say this as we wait for those people. Do not believe you can do what you want. Do not believe you can do what you want with this body because this body doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. It's not yours. You didn't create it. You didn't de determine the purpose. It's not yours. If you violate God's rules, something is going to die. And sometimes it's, it's right away death. Sometimes it takes time. God is very patient. But the only reason you're alive today is because God's grace. It's not because you're good. Amen. Let's give these people a hand as they come on down. Amen. Amen. 